CPUs execute machine language instructions, but what can you do quickly with just one instruction? Some 40 years ago, you were maybe able to calculate the sum of two small integers. Some 20 years ago, you were able to do more complicated operations, such as the multiplication of floating point numbers. But nowadays, you can do a lot more. You can take entire vectors of floating point numbers and do, for example, element-wise multiplication for them. It turns out that modern CPUs are, in essence, vector processors. Even if your code is only doing individual floating point operations, compilers will still generate code that instructs the CPU to use its vector registers to do calculations. If you look at CPUs in typical desktop computers, you will see that they have got two different kinds of registers. Registers that can hold 64-bit integers and registers that can hold 256-bit vectors. And if you compile your normal C++ code, you will see that the compiler will typically use integer registers to hold pointers, indexes, counters, and to do plain old integer arithmetic. While vector registers are used for doing floating point arithmetic. But we can do a lot more with the vector registers if you want. A single precision floating point number is 32 bits long, and a double precision floating point number is 64 bits long. So one 256 bit vector register is large enough to hold, for example, four double precision floating point numbers or eight single precision floating point numbers. But you can use the large capacity of vector registers also in many other creative ways. You can store, for example, 32 bytes of data in one such register. Here is a piece of text that is 31 characters long. So you can actually store the entire sentence in one vector register. CPUs can do all kinds of operations with their vector registers, but a very typical example is element-wise arithmetic operations. For example, element-wise addition of two vectors. This instruction v add ps tells the CPU that registers ymm0 and ymm1 contain vectors of eight single precision floating point numbers. This is the PS part, packed singles. And it asks the CPU to do element-wise addition of these vectors and to store the result in register YMM2. So the instruction works a lot like taking two arrays and adding all pairs of elements. We are doing eight floating point additions here in parallel with just one instruction. And it is fast, as fast as doing just one floating point addition. But how do we write C++ code that makes use of these highly efficient machine language instructions? There's always a hard way. If you want, you can make your code completely unreadable by using so-called intrinsic functions. But there's fortunately also an easy way. Your compiler can help you. You can define so-called vector types, and then if, for instance, x and y are defined to be vectors, you can just write x plus y in your code, and you will get a vector addition. The compiler will generate the right machine language instructions for you. Unfortunately, the syntax of defining a vector type in GCC is pretty ugly, but you don't really need to remember it or say it that often either. Just copy-paste this fragment to the beginning of your program. And from then on, you can just use this type float8t whenever you want to define variables that are vectors. And now it is easy. You can think of float8t 
asset type that behaves a lot like an array of eight floating point numbers. But you can also write things like a plus b, and it will do element-wise addition for these two arrays. And the key point is that whenever you use vector types, the compiler will generate very efficient machine code. This a plus b here will be translated into just one machine language, language instruction, and this instruction will do all eight additions simultaneously in parallel. In general, you can pretty freely write code that uses vector types, and you can expect the compiler to do the right thing. Addition and multiplication will result in element-wise operations. You can mix scalars and vectors, and you, you will get what you would expect. You can also refer to individual elements of the vector as if it was just a normal array of eight elements. But please note that as soon as you start to refer to individual elements, you will no longer benefit from efficient vector operations. To do lots of work in parallel, you really need to do operations with entire vectors. Maybe refer to individual elements in pre-processing and post-processing, but make sure the critical inner loops do as much as possible with complete vectors. You can imagine that float 8D is a small class that contains eight floats and has some convenient overloaded arithmetic operations. You can pass this freely around in the code, and the compiler will do the right thing. For instance, this piece of code just works fine. You can pass vectors as parameters to functions. You can define local variables of vector types. You can even define small constant size arrays of vectors. Your function can return vectors. And the compiler will not only compile it correctly, but it will generate efficient code, something like this, with just four machine language instructions. GCC even managed to keep everything in registers. Here, parameters a and b are passed in registers ymm0 and ymm1. The vector addition a plus b is translated to one instruction. Vector subtraction a minus b is translated to one instruction. And vector multiplication is translated to one instruction. And finally, the result is returned in register ymm0. So vector types are pretty easy to use and lead to efficient code. There's only one complication. If you store vectors somewhere in memory, you must take care of proper alignment. Basically, all memory addresses have to be multiples of 32. If you just reserve some memory with malloc, this is not guaranteed. Sometimes you accidentally get such addresses, sometimes not. Your code may sometimes work correctly, sometimes it may crash. You must use some memory allocation function that guarantees correct alignment. In the course material, we have got detailed examples and in the code templates that we have provided for the exercises, you can find memory allocation functions that you can use directly. Please keep in mind that you will need this whenever you allocate arrays of vectors from the heap. And only then, there's no need to use them for anything allocated from the stack. There, the compiler will take care of the right alignment for you. So now you know what vector operations can do and how to get the compiler to generate them. But figuring out how to use them to actually speed up your program may require plenty of creativity. And this is something we will discuss in the next